Steve Shepard, professor of entomology at Washington State University, and Susan Kobe, a WSU research associate, discuss the causes of colony collapse disorder in honeybees, as well as their project to import honeybee semen from other countries to find solutions. Well, there are a lot of challenges that face honeybees, uh, you know, both, both related to, uh, you know, simply getting enough food and having a, you know, a adequate place to live, to being managed within the sort of agricultural system that we have where, you know, there's uh, pesticides applied to crops, there's crops that are maintained with very clean fields around them or, or understory, so there's, uh, you know, trouble for the bees to find food. Uh, there are new diseases, some are highly contagious bacterial diseases, some are viruses that are transmitted by parasitic mites. Varroa mite is a, um, it's a parasite which feeds on the developing brood. Um, the, the bees will cap the brood in the cell and the varroa mite will go in there before it's capped and feed on the bees. Um, it also will introduce pathogens, viruses, bacteria, things like this. Um, and it's fairly large. It's like having a, a, a large dinner plate on your belly. Um, and they reproduce in the cells and you'll get things like deformed wing virus where the bees, the wings don't develop so the bees can't fly. Or you'll get really tiny looking bees because they, they, their nutrition has just been taken away from them. Within a couple of years, a colony with no intervention from the beekeeper will normally be killed by this uh, parasite. We as beekeepers and as growers oftentimes put the honeybee colonies on a large monoculture. So then the, the bees are bringing in only a, you know, a single type of pollen and not getting the, the varied diet that they need for you know, the best health. We're trying to diversify the U.S. Uh, honeybee gene pool because uh, there was an importation ban in 1922 and that stock that was initially imported has been expanded to establish the USB industry. So I think that if we have more genetic diversity within our stock, we'll be better, better have better tools to do selection and breeding towards mite resistance and just general more vigor. You know, the requirements to survive in southern Florida or southern Arizona are quite different than if you want to live in Maine or Michigan or you know, northern Idaho. As far as what you need to do to make it through that winter. Here at Washington State, we're going to Europe to collect uh, semen of several honeybee subspecies. The three that we're primarily interested in are the Italian honeybee, the Carniolan honeybee, which is a honeybee that's native to the Alps and adapted for cold climates, and the Caucasian honeybee, which is a honeybee from the Caucasus Mountains. One of our goals is to develop a uh, sperm bank repository. And I think that's not just, a, not just for the U.S., but it has potential worldwide. You have a lot of um, ecotypes of bees, different subspecies, these little pockets of native bees that are under a lot of uh, duress. Just with the, uh, the pathogen loads, the worldwide movement of bees, and if we can preserve those, um, now that we have the technologies and with liquid nitrogen in the future, I, I want to be able to just pull out a tube of semen from, a, from the liquid nitrogen tank and give you a custom order of whatever you want in, in a bee. Do you want a different races, different traits, different whatever it is, that combination I, I think we can do in the future. So to me that's really exciting. That's really the direction I'd like to see it go.